Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the presentation. This is Jay Thorne, and I'm here to talk to you about how to leverage audio to become a career author. I'm so excited to share so much of what I've learned about uh, how audio can really contribute to uh, an author business. So let me go ahead and start uh, by just reading you the, uh, the quick summary here so you'll get an idea of what this is going to be about. Audio adoption continues to explode, and authors who can take advantage of this medium are most likely to build long-term, sustainable careers. Discover what you need to do and how to do it from a veteran independent musician, producer, publisher, and podcaster. That's me. And if you want to check out any of my stuff, I'm at theauthorlife.com. But uh, let's get into what you are going to learn from this presentation. So there's basically three things that I'm going to be focusing on and then an overall objective. And we're going to come back at the end just to make sure that all of that has been covered. Number one, why audio is different than blogging or YouTube slash video. Audio is definitely different. And we're going to talk about why that's different and why that matters now more so than ever before. Number two, you're going to learn about different types of audio products and services. So podcasting is clearly a big one, but there are other ways you can use audio in your author products and services. And then number three, how it can help sustain an author business. So how can the use of audio work for you in whatever it is you happen to be doing? Here is my objective for you for this presentation. I want you to learn how to leverage audio to build a successful author services business such as graphic design, editing, coaching, marketing, or event planning. Now, if you happen to be an author, clearly writing is your primary objective on a day-to-day -day basis. But many of us, uh, myself included, can build very successful businesses around the industry and the profession of writing, and audio can be a big component of that. So even if you are not interested in creating an author services business right now, you might decide you want to do some graphic design or editing or coaching down the road. And if you're thinking that way now, audio is definitely something you want to consider. So we have to ask then, why is audio different? Uh, clearly, you know, blogging has been around for a long time, and some people are saying podcasting is the new blogging. Um, and video is very popular, and YouTube continues to grow. The, the number of uh, the number of available videos uh, posted on a daily basis is just staggering. Uh, so those those things are still there. But what, I want to talk about why audio is different. Number one. I think the accessibility of smartphones has completely transformed the audio landscape. Even 10 years ago, most people listened to podcasts on desktop computers, and that is clearly not the case anymore. The fact that we all have these very sophisticated computers in our pockets at all times with nearly ubiquitous access means it's e easier than ever to, uh, to listen to things on your smartphone. Secondly, I think there's been a shift in the way people consume audio or listen to audio, I should say. And I think, uh, you know, I remember as a kid gathering around a record player and then a CD player and listening to music with my friends. But my kids don't do that these days. Uh, I think with the ad, again, with the advent of the smartphone and the use of earbuds, listening to anything has become much more of a private act. So I think that is why uh, we're in a different era of audio right now. Probably one of the most important things to consider, especially when you're comparing it to uh, both blogs and video, is that listening to audio requires what I call secondary attention. That means you don't have to be staring at a screen. So people will listen to audio while they are driving, while they are doing chores, while they are walking the dog. Uh, it doesn't require you to sit down and focus 100% of your attention. And, and so therefore, I think people consume much more audio. And that's certainly the case for me. Finally, I think uh, to a lesser degree, there's a, a rise in the dedicated voice command devices, such as the Amazon Echo. And I think people are just engaging audio 
in uh, in a different way, in ways that they they haven't done before historically. And so these devices are definitely becoming uh, more mainstream and more popular, and that is going to make it even easier to listen to dedicated audio on them. All right, so let's stop for a minute here and let's figure out what are your audio content creation options because there are a lot of different things that you can do. Uh, I'm going to focus on one specifically in this presentation, that's podcasting. However, uh, podcasting is not the only way you can leverage audio in your business. Uh, you can uh, do audiobook narration. Uh, you can also get into radio, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Uh, but first, I thought it, it might be interesting if we just took a look at some of the most current statistics around podcasting. And if you are curious, uh, this comes from uh, podcastinsights.com, and there's a link on the slide there if you want to check it out. But there's some really interesting things I wanted to, to show you. First of all, 51% uh, of the U.S. population has listened to a podcast. And 49% of listening is done at home, uh, with about 22% done uh, listening in the car. So clearly, we've, we've passed a tipping point of majority, at least in the United States, for the number of people who not only know what a podcast is, uh, but who are listening to them on a regular basis. Generally speaking, podcast listeners are loyal, affluent, and educated. 80% uh, listen to all or most of each episode. So I think that's a really telling statistic, especially as an author. You can imagine how powerful that would be if we could have that kind of read-through on our books. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting stat. Uh, and this is also uh, pretty interesting because reading tends to be, the activity tends to be dominated predominantly by women. But in the podcasting world, it's, it's fairly even with men edging out women uh, as of March of 2019. About 56% of men listen to podcasts and about 44% of women. So uh, also, you know, very interesting statistics there. Uh, Clearly, you know, as I said, we've passed the tipping point in the mainstream, but 50% of all homes are podcast fans. That's 60 million homes. Um, and we can get some insights as to where people are listening. 50% uh, listen at home um, and 22% listen while they're in the car or truck. 11% uh, listen at work and... Um, 4% while they're working out. I wonder if that's because people just don't work out <laughs> as much as they do right in their car. Uh, but you can, you can clearly see that there is, uh, you know, there is quite a surge in listenership. And you're probably not surprised to find out that smartphones are what's driving this. So we, we have, uh, you know, 157% increase since 2014 and, uh, in list listenership. And the question is, in the past 30 days, which device have you used to watch, listen, or download a podcast? And while the computer, tablet, and other devices remained relatively the same from 2014 to 2017, as I said, uh, up 157% on smartphone usage. So I think it's pretty clear uh, who's listening, where they're listening, and how they're listening. Uh, that's, that's the smartphone for you. Let me tell you a little bit about my podcast journey so you have some context on what I'm going to share with you. I've been a bit of a podcast junkie. I, I, I started listening to them when they first came out 10 or 15 years ago. And then about five years ago, I started creating my own podcast right about the time I was getting serious about becoming a career author. And since May 22nd of 2014, which is the day I posted my very first podcast episode, I have uh, launched or produced a total of eight different podcasts for a combination of 564 episodes. And right now, as we speak in August of 2019, I have two new podcasts that are in pre-production. Uh, so I have a lot of experience in this. Uh, I have not had the same show for five or 10 years, but I have recorded over uh, 560 episodes uh, in all those different shows. So I thought I could talk a little bit about um, how that came about and sort of the natural progression because I think it will be useful for you to understand how as a predominantly fiction writer I got into podcasting and where I am now and how that has changed. So uh, the very first podcast I did was called The Horror Writers Podcast. Uh, I did that one myself and I was uh, trying to appeal to other uh, writers who were writing horror 
and uh, I started out by myself. I had um, a few co-hosts. Uh, eventually, Zach Bohannon came came along there, and uh, we did that one together. And, uh, and that was, as I said, targeted predominantly at writers of horror. Then I started Dark Arts Theater, which was my attempt at getting some uh, uh, content marketing going for my fiction. For uh, I write horror, dark fantasy, post apoc dystopian, and Dark Arts Theater was a highly produced podcast that I also did as a YouTube show, and it included all things uh, dark, including movies and books and music, and it was a incredible fun, but it really didn't connect with the audience I was hoping for, and so I did uh, two or three seasons of that, and and then stopped. The next one was the intronaut. Uh, the in, I am an, uh, an introvert, an INTJ to be specific. And at the time, uh, three years or so ago, there was not really any podcast dedicated to introverts. Now that has changed since, but I decided to launch uh, an NPR sort of solo style uh, monologue type podcast called The Intronaut. I was proud that I was able to do 100 episodes uh, over two years of uh, podcasting every week on The Intronaut. But then I realized that uh, I had said about all I could say about being an introvert. And so I decided that at episode 100 would be a good place to stop. I then uh, started The Writer's Well, a podcast with my good friend Rachel Heron. And uh, The Writer's Well is still going, uh, well over 100 episodes. Every week we ask each other a question about uh, the writing life, and, uh, and we each answer it. And it's great fun, and we're good friends, and, and that's The Writer's Well. About the uh, beginning of 2018, I started the Career Author Podcast with Zach Bohannon, and that is dedicated to uh, writers, struggling writers who want to become career authors. And we talk about the transition from uh, doing it as a hobby to doing it as, as a profession. And then finally, the newest one is the Author Life Podcast. And this is uh, sort of like a personal diary, but it's me talking about what it means to live the author life. And, uh, and I do that as a, a blog post and podcast. And the Author Life Podcast episodes are rather short. They're usually less than eight minutes or so. Uh, just sort of a, a quick little episode shot and to get you on your way. Now, I did start one other podcast that wasn't on the previous slide. That was called Gen X Rock and Talk. And this was an experiment I did that I thoroughly enjoyed for uh, about nine months. Um, and then my schedule prohibited me continuing. But I, it, it was a podcast called Gen X Rock and Talk. And I would basically have people come on and talk about uh, the favorite, my favorite music of the 80s and 90s. And I was also a DJ at, uh, and still am at uh, WJCU. And I, so I would sort of simulcast the podcast uh, on the radio show as well. I would play the interviews I pre-recorded on the radio show along with the music. And then the podcast was just the interviews and the conversations. And that was great fun. So those are a variety of different ways that I've sort of played around with podcasting. And, um, and I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i come back to explain why I think the author services one is probably best suited, even though the others were a lot of fun. The next question then is, okay, all this podcasting stuff sounds great and it sounds like you're having a lot of fun, but how do you sustain an author business with it? And, uh, and really, you can't necessarily sustain it solely on podcasting unless you are one in the top 1% of, of the podcasters in the world. But there are ways to make both direct revenue and indirect revenue. So I thought I would start by talking about direct revenue. There are several ways you can make money straight from your podcast. Number one is donations. You can ask people who enjoy listening to contribute, um, sort of like a tip jar. And Patreon is the best website for that. Uh, Patreon, which I'll show you in a moment, allows you to create bonuses and incentives for people who contribute. It's on a subscription model so that you don't have to deal directly with uh, the listeners. They, they do it through Patreon. And it's a great way to sort of build, uh, build goodwill amongst your following. I will say it's hard to start uh, a Patreon page if you don't already have an audience. So you kind of need some people who are interested in what you're doing um, before you put up a Patreon page. Secondly, again, once you get listenership up and you start to get some numbers, you can get sponsorship. You can have uh, companies or businesses who are related to your industry or your niche uh, offer to sponsor. And what that means is they'll pay you a little bit of money and then you promote them on the show. Now, uh, as of 
as of the, this recording, uh, we only have I only have one sponsor for one podcast, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it's a it's a sponsorship we really believe in and we use. So we don't necessarily even entertain sponsorships by companies who have services or products that we haven't used or we're not fans of. And then thirdly, you can do what's called in-episode ad roll. So there are uh, platforms which will allow you to, they will automatically, dynamically insert ads into uh, into the podcast. And then based on the number of listens that you get, um, they will pay you a certain percentage of money. So uh, none of these three, as I said, are uh, things you can retire on. They are typically not direct sources of, of revenue that can sustain you completely, but they do complement author services quite well. So as I mentioned, Patreon, a big fan of Patreon, I've been using them for years. Uh, there is a Patreon page for the career author. And one of the big bonuses that Zach and I do with a career author is we do uh, two bonus episodes a month for our listeners. One of them is a Q&A. The other one is a movie or television show analysis where we break down either a movie or an episode of a television show along with a worksheet. And we give that to uh, the people who listen, who are career authors and want to want to become good at that. So it's a great incentive for them. I also have a Patreon page with Rachel at the Writers Well. And in there we have uh, little bonuses that we have. There are stickers private Slack group, and we also do a periodic uh, question and answer video for those people. So both the career author and the writer as well exist as Patreon pages, and, uh, and they, they really help to defray some of the cost of podcasting, including things like uh, domain name, registration, and hosting. You have to have your uh, audio files hosted somewhere so that they can be distributed to iTunes, which I will get to shortly. All right, as far as the other sources of direct revenue, as I mentioned, uh, our sponsorship for the Career Author Podcast is Kobo Writing Life. We're big fans of Kobo. We know the people over there. They're good people. Uh, they do great things for the author community. So that's a very natural sponsorship. As far as the in-episode ad rolls, I experimented with that on the intranaut. There is a blog platform called Blog Talk Radio. If you go to Blog Talk Radio and you publish your podcast through them, you will have the option to insert uh, in-episode ad rolls. And then depending on the number of listeners you get, uh, you can make some direct revenue from that. So those are, that's a, an overview of direct revenue. Let's now talk a little bit about indirect revenue. So this means uh, that you are, you are benefiting from podcasting, uh, but in a secondary fashion. So examples of indirect revenue would be uh, client work, if you are hosting events, or possibly hosting conferences or speaking at those. Those would be uh, ways of generating indirect revenue from podcasting. So how exactly does that work? All right, well, clients first. Uh, clients who listen to your podcast, or I should say potential clients, feel like they know you already. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up to me at an event or a conference and just start a conversation as, with, as if we're old friends. And then they realize, they probably see the look on my face, and they realize we've never met before. And they say, oh my goodness, you're in my ear every week. I just feel like I know you. And that happens over and over again. And so many people who I meet at conferences or events who started listening to the podcast have now become clients of mine. And you, you can see uh, all the smiling faces <laughs> of people when you meet them in real life. Uh, as I said, they feel like they know you. And it's a, it's a really fantastic thing. Uh, secondly, you can uh, create indirect revenue if you are hosting events. So Zach and I, uh, in generally under the Career Author brand, we do different author events. We are kind of famous for the Authors on a Train event. We have uh, taken people from Chicago to New Orleans on an overnight train and done uh, writing exercises. We're going to do it in California in January of 2020. We're going to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco. We also do world building events. So we've done things like uh, Night of the Writing Dead in Pittsburgh, where we celebrated uh, George Romero's 50th anniversary of the Night of the Living Dead movie. We did uh, a post apoc rock apoc weekend um, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we are doing uh, Sci-Fi Seattle in Seattle at Mopop. So we do these really unique author events. And a lot of the people who come on these events came through the podcast. They got to know us, and then when they heard about us hosting these events, there was already a trust that was built there because they're listening to us all the time. 
And very similarly to uh, events, you have things like conferences or speaking gigs. Uh, Zach and I, for the past two years, spoke at the Sell More Book Show Summit in Chicago in May. Uh, and then we are, uh, we are sort of rebranding that as the Career Author Summit in uh, May of 2020 in Nashville. That event, unfortunately, if you're listening and not going, is already sold out. But that is another great place where uh, people who are listening to a podcast want to participate in this uh, real-life event. So uh, clients, events, conferences are ways you can create indirect revenue through the podcast as people get to know and trust you. So the next question is, okay, this all sounds great. So how do I start a podcast? Now, if, uh, if you're new to podcasting, my first question is, are you listening to podcasts? Because much like reading, I think if you are not a fan of the genre in which you are writing, it's very difficult to write books in that genre. And I would say the same true is true of podcasting. If you have not regularly been listening to podcasts, but you think you might want to start one, you should start listening to the ones, uh, to, to podcasts, especially ones that you think would be most similar to the, to the type of podcast you would like to create. One of the cool things about podcasting is there's no rules. There's no gatekeeper. You can basically do whatever you want. That being said, it is good to put some type of structure or guidelines around your podcast so that uh, you are coming off as somewhat familiar to people who listen to a lot of podcasts. So really what that gets down to is this idea of format. There are a number of different ways you can uh, structure your podcast. You can do a fiction podcast, which is basically like uh, doing short stories, narrating short stories. It's storytelling. It's fiction. Uh, that, that's a form of podcast. Another one is the interview. Very popular. Uh, you are the host. You have different people on uh, weekly or monthly, however often you podcast. And uh, not only do you get to learn a lot by interviewing other people, but it keeps it interesting for the listeners. There are roundtable formats where uh, a small group of people will get together on a regular basis and discuss something. And this would be very similar to, say, your uh, morning talk shows that might be on television. You also have what I call the single host, and this is something like what I did for the intranaut, where you are having more of like a monologue style, NPR, maybe personal diary uh, style of podcast. That would be, I would call that a single host. And then you have co-host uh, podcasts. So that's like what I do with the Writer's Well with Rachel and the Career Author with Zach. And what, the same two people show up every week. And, uh, and I, can, I can honestly tell you it's a little easier uh, a little easier to stay motivated if you know a co-host is counting on you as opposed to trying to do the podcast by yourself. So uh, I would say the single host out of all of those is probably the most difficult to maintain over the long run, although it's quite possible and you can still do well with it. And then this isn't really a format, but I kind of added it here, uh, industry specific. So you can do, you know, most of my podcasts are industry specific. Right now, the ones that are running are geared towards writers. Uh, but you could do a, a, you know, a podcast on any type of interest or hobby or industry. Uh, and then you could use any of those uh, previously mentioned formats to uh, produce that industry specific show. What kind of tools do you need? Well, getting into the weeds and the highly technical stuff of podcasting is sort of beyond the scope of this presentation. But I will give you just a quick overview so you'll at least know where to go. Podcasting used to require a lot more technical skill. Nowadays, not so much. Uh, you could record podcast episodes with your smartphone. I wouldn't recommend it because I think listeners have become more sophisticated and they expect more as far as audio quality is concerned. But you could. You could do it. I think at a minimum, it's great to get yourself a USB microphone, something that will plug into either a Mac or a PC, does not require a ton of setup or special outboard gear, uh, and, the, and the sound quality will be significantly better. There are different softwares, uh, software packages you can use to mix audio or edit it if you need to. Audacity is free. That's a pretty common one. Uh, from way back in my days of being in a band, I use a, a program called Reaper. Uh, Reaper is also a very low-cost solution to uh, editing and mixing software. Uh, 
And then finally, the recording piece, especially if you are uh, doing a podcast format that involves someone else, you need some way of recording the interaction. So things like Skype, Zoom, Google Hangout, these are recording tools. Currently, I love Zoom. Uh, for me, it's the easiest of all of them, uh, the least buggy. I've had some serious problems with Skype. Uh, but but Zoom is Zoom records both audio and video. So if you wanted to say post the uh, the the video version of your podcast on YouTube, in addition to the audio uh, as an iTunes podcast, you could certainly do that. So the next question then has to get to well, you know, how do you once you do these recordings, how do you get the podcast up on iTunes and all these different places? And that's called distribution. There are many companies these days who do podcast distribution. The ones I'm gonna talk about are the ones I've used personally, so they're not necessarily the best. Uh, I just wanna recommend ones that I've used. Libsyn is the oldest, they've been around the longest, but quite honestly, their platform is the clunkiest. Uh, they could use a redesign of their user interface. It's, um, it's not always easy to figure out what you're doing in Libsyn, but it is. they have been around the longest. Uh, relative newcomers are Pippa and Transistor.fm. I've used both of those. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, you do have to pay for distribution um, depending on the service you use and uh, the, and the the features you want. You're looking at anywhere from five to twenty dollars per month in order to distribute your podcast. So that'll just give you a ballpark. As far as where you can get your podcast uh, positioned. Obviously, iTunes is the big one. Most people will listen to podcasts through iTunes, but that is changing. So you uh, would want to consider other platforms such as Google Play Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, Radio Public. Uh, there's a bunch. The good news is whenever you're going through your distributor, uh, Libsyn, Pippa, Transistor, FM, they will automatically distribute to all of those platforms or a lot of them. Uh, you might have to check boxes to determine, you know, which ones you want your podcast to show up in, but uh, all of them will distribute to iTunes, and then a lot of these secondary platforms are available through these different distributors. A question I get, which is something I have to wrestle with myself when it comes to podcasting, is a website. Is it necessary? I don't think it is. I think a uh, if you use some of these distributors, uh, Libsyn. Uh, Pippa, Transistor FM, they all provide an automatically generated web page in the distribution package. So what that means is you can go ahead and hit publish on the episode and then it automatically populates a standalone web page. The reason I don't feel like a website isn't completely necessary just for a podcast is because it's the opening of a funnel, right? Basically what you want to do is you want to take people from a podcast and move them into your ecosystem. So it's just a net. It's basically a net. Now, if you are tying your podcast into an author business, then I would I would might consider the reversal, which is build a website for your author service and put a podcast page on it. That would require a little extra work uh, as opposed to an automatically created one on the distribution platform, but it would certainly benefit you in the wrong, in the long run. But your goal is to get people from the podcast into your ecosystem, whether that is your mailing list, products and services, whatever it happens to be. Uh, the podcast is usually the first exposure, and so that's where people are coming in. How do you get people there in the first place? That's a really difficult question. There's no easy answer to it. Listener engagement is a major question for uh, most podcasters. And right now, the best tools we have really are social media. The reason social media can work for engagement where it doesn't work as well with, uh, say, book sales is because most podcasts are free. And it's really easy for people to share episodes, to share podcasts that they like. And, uh, and there isn't a stigma attached if you're sharing something that you know someone else has to pay for. So uh, I like social media as, as, a, as a form of uh, promotion and, and gathering lis listener engagement. I will tweet out every time I have a new episode of a podcast and people will comment and share. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a great use of social media, whereas it is, might have been coming up short in other aspects of our author business. So I thought to, to wrap up and conclude on this presentation, uh, hopefully you can start to see how a podcast can really drive traffic to your author 
uh, business or services. The key here is that your podcast must be directly tied to the, the service that you're offering and it must be valuable. So in our case, the career author is a good example. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I do editing services. And so a lot of the episodes is uh, Zach and I are talking about issues that writers care about. And we're, we're giving it, we're not holding anything back. We're telling them everything that we know we're sharing with them. And then when it comes time to hire an editor, what we're, what I'm hoping is that they go, you know what? That guy, Jay Thorne on the career authors, I really, I really agree with what he's saying. He also edits. I'm going to reach out to him. And again, you have that built-in trust uh, because you've been in their ears for a long time. So I think um, it's tempting to think you're going to monetize the podcast, uh, and that's possible, but I think it's a much better mindset to approach a podcast, podcast as an authentic lead generation. It's sort of the next phase of content marketing. I know content marketing gets a bad rap in the internet marketing world, but it really is... Uh, a great way to provide free, authentic value. And then when people are ready and they need services, you're going to be at the top of their list. So I think that's a really important conclusion that you should keep in mind. So if we come back to uh, what you've learned, you've learned why audio is different than blogging or YouTube and video. And I think if we had to boil that down to a simple answer, it would be the smartphone. You've learned about different types of audio products and services. So we, we did talk about audiobook narration and radio very, very briefly because I don't believe the opportunities are there unless you are a professional audiobook narrator or professional radio DJ. So I think for now, podcasting for most of us is the best, most viable option to supplement your author business and services. And then you've also learned how it can help sustain an author business. So once again, you get people into your ecosystem because they know you, they authentically like you, and when the time comes and they need a service, you're going to be the first person they turn to. And so I think it is a long tail game. It's, it's not something you cannot build a podcast audience overnight unless you are already a celebrity or already have quite a following. But over time, it can really help sustain that author business. Hopefully we met your objective here. You've learned how to leverage audio to build a successful author services business, such as graphic design, editing, coaching, marketing, or event planning. And one way you could think about that is if you are a, also a graphic designer and you want to do book covers, for example, creating a podcast about book cover design would be the perfect connection. Uh, just like if you were going to do editing, uh, you maybe start a podcast where you edit a short scene every week as an episode. Uh, that's how you're going to build trust, especially if you're niching down into these different elements of the author business. Uh, and so I think if you, you can very easily leverage the podcast audio uh, by providing real value to these people. Before you go, I want to let you know if you go to theauthorlife.com slash ally, A-L-L-I, you can get the free Author Life Method Essential Guide, which includes essential information to help you take your idea to market, including tips on craft, publishing, marketing, and more. Plus, you'll get my free video course that will take you from amateur to pro while avoiding many of the most common mistakes. So if you go there to theauthorlife.com slash ally, A-L-L-I, you can download that stuff 100% free, no obligation. Hope it helps you out. So again, thank you for spending the time with me. This was How to Leverage Audio to Become a Career Author. I am Jay Thorne, and uh, happy writing to you. <laughs>